One of the hottest tickets on Broadway happens to be the longest running show on Broadway. That's because after 35 years, time has run out to say goodbye to the Phantom of the Opera, leaving mixed emotions for the man who composed it. I sat down with the legendary Andrew Lloyd Webber. Here is part of our conversation. Well, we're here to talk about the closing, but let me go back to 1988, the opening night on Broadway. What do you remember? Well, I remember it was, uh, uh, it was a very, very special night um, because there was huge anticipation of it coming to New York. And, um, it, and, and also, um, I was married to Sarah Brightman, who was playing Christine. And, of course, you know, I was quite nervous for her, to put it mildly. Um, so it was a sort of double... Double nerves, if you know what I mean. One, obviously, that um, and, and, and excitement about it opening on Broadway, but very much, you know, hoping that it all worked for her. And um, it's very special, actually, that she's back in New York, you know, for the final show. Were you able to, to recognize at the time what a hit Phantom would become? I don't think uh, when it opened in London that I knew uh, it was going to be what it became. Um, in fact, how could one? Um, but by the time it came here, um, uh, it, it, it had become such a phenomenon back in London and um, so many people from America had come over specifically to see it that I had a suspicion that it would have to go horribly wrong here for it not to work. Um, but nobody, I mean, when you sit down to write a musical, you don't say... I'm going to try and write a massive blockbuster. You, what you do is you write what you want to write. I mean, remember the one thing that Hal Prince always used to say, Hal Prince who directed it, is never be afraid of failing. You know, you should always try something different and never be frightened about failing. And I'd never written before Phantom of the Opera anything that was a high romance. In fact, I hadn't written a romantic musical at all because... Joseph Amazing Technicolor, Green Coat, Jesus Christ Superstar, and the wife of a right wing Argentine dictator, um, let alone a load of cats, um, <laughs> didn't give me much of an opportunity to show um, a romantic side. And that's how Phantom happened, because I was really keen to write a high romance just to see if I could. It's amazing back then you didn't have hashtags, you didn't have people tweeting likes or, or dislikes. So, how did you, how did you measure other than, than receipts? Well, you see, this is the funny thing. Um, we discovered very, very shortly after Phantom opened that there were these girls, young girls coming to it, and there was a whole Phantom, we discovered, magazine, a sort of underground magazine, where every one of these girls at one point, and by the time it had got to Broadway, it had already got to Australia, it was going to be, and, and you know, you, they, they were reviewing every single performance in this sort of shared fan um, forum. So it was like a kind of social media before the, the day. But, but what is interesting to me now is, is that Phantom uh, is doing really, really the best, I suppose, it's ever done in London since the very opening. And what's happened there is, is that, um, like, 18 months ago, and you were talking about social media, um, kids started to discover Phantom again. And so Phantom was number one over Halloween on TikTok. So why couldn't it have that kind of success on Broadway? Well, the point is it has. That's, uh, and if, I mean, I am lucky enough that I own theatres in London because it's my way of putting back something into the profession that's been so good to me. And I, um, I'm very proud of the fact that we run our theatres not for profit because every penny goes back into the buildings. But I can tell you that if I was a theatre owner with the business that, that Phantom is doing here now, I would be saying, I, I'm crazy. Are crazy. Um, but the other thing, though, to just take on board, though, is a show like Phantom is extremely expensive to run. And this is one of the difficulties, I think, that um, Broadway is going to have to face, is that, I mean, would you like to guess how much Phantom actually costs a week to run? I, I've seen some numbers, seven-figure numbers. Costs about... if. If you averaged it out right now, it probably costs about nine hundred and fifty to a million dollars a week to run. A week. A week. Yeah. Is is that why you're pulling the plug? Well, I'm not pulling the plug. It's something to do with me, <laughs> um, and I wouldn't if it was me. But um, it 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 is no question about it that um, 
before the pandemic and then coming out of the pandemic and everything, that the, the costs of running a musical like, like Phantom are really, really incredibly high. I mean, this is one of the problems on Broadway now is, is that, I mean, even to put a play on, you're going to be talking about a $5 million investment. And plays don't make that kind of money. Or I can't tell you whether it would be doing the sort of huge figures that it's doing now. Um, but I suspect that what's happened is two things, that the announcement of the closure has made people realise, well, you know, we've got a chance to see it. But I think what's happened is that a young audience, and if you just look at the people who were outside the theatre, you know, this morning, Kim Tikic, they're all the same young girls' age that we used to have when the show first opened. And I think that it's been discovered through social media um, and a whole new audience has come to it. And two things have happened. And uh, that, that means that I, I think what would have happened is, is that if it, if it wasn't closing, I think it wouldn't be doing quite what it's doing at the moment, because of course it wouldn't be. But I think it would be able to run on. If, if it was up to you, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be closing. But it is closing. Are you going to be emotional on Sunday? Well, I'm going to just be concerned about what the Phantom is going to think about this. Because, you know, the Phantom doesn't like uh, his legend not to be told. So, you know, who knows what might happen on Sunday? I mean, it might... Who, who, who could tell the Phantom? The Phantom might be very displeased. Mm. Does that suggest that maybe it will come back to Broadway? Well, I, I don't know, because, I mean, I'm only uh, the composer who does what the Phantom tells me to do. I mean, if I'm instructed to write something, I, I, I wrote it. Um, lest a disaster beyond my imagination occurred to me. So I have no idea what the fans is going to do. He, he, he's not, he's unpredictable. And the one thing I do know is he's very, very fond of New York. Mm. The open, the overture, um, that, that heavy, thunderous organ. Do you, do you enjoy watching audiences when they realize? Well, the beginning of the Phantom, I mean, uh, well, the chandelier rising from a disused opera house and the opera house transforming itself back in front of your eyes was something I really wanted to do. Uh, and I remember saying to Hal Prince that um, my idea is that we have this broken chandelier and it re reassembles itself and flies over the audience. And I remember Hal saying, yeah, absolutely, let's, you know, let's go on and do it, you know. And um, it's, no, it's, it, that, I think, is unrepeatable. And I think what is, what is un unrepeatable completely is that experience in anything other than the theatre. I mean, the moment that chandelier rises, it's pure theatre. It's immersive, pure theatre. Folks who have not seen The Phantom, describe it. What's well, it, what's it about? What, The Phantom? Well, uh, it is, in the end, a high romance. I can't tell you why The Phantom works. Um, I can only say what other people have said to me. Uh, but the, it strikes a chord, and I think that it, one of the things about it is, is that you empathise with The Phantom, and you do with Christine. And I think it would be silly to say that I think most people in the audience would have loved it if it had worked for both of them, but it, of course, didn't. Because your inclination is to be afraid of the phantom, but you feel some empathy with yeah, it. Yeah, I think you do. I think, our, I think our phantom is a tragic figure, not, uh, not a figure where, you, um, where you, you sort of are terrified of him or whatever. You know, I, I wasn't trying to do that. I wasn't trying to do a horror story. The book itself is very confused. It can't make its mind up whether it's a historical telling of facts or it masquerading as what it does. But in, uh, whether it's just telling a factual story, whether it's a horror story, whether it's Bengali and Trilby, whether it's, you know, a high romance. I chose to go with the high romance. This is an unfair question, but I'll ask it anyway. Is, is it your best work? I can't ever um, say what I, I personally... I think, I think it's as good... As, as anything I've done. I think what uh, it uh, put it in a different way. Uh, I, I think it's very, very rare in a musical, very, very rare, for all of the ingredients to come together in the same way that Phantom did. The production, the lighting, the choreography. Um, I, it, it, it doesn't happen very often. Um, I, I, th I think probably of the recent musicals, where that, I think um, Hamilton, obviously, that's happened. Um, but it, it tends to happen sort of once in a generation. And so what I would say is, is that Phantom 
is probably the, uh, the one musical of mine where absolutely everything came together. Uh, we never changed anything at all in preview, at all. And, I mean, that will never happen to me again, and it's certainly never happened to me before. And, and, and um, yes, I've had other, other productions that have worked very well, and How Princess Evita was terrific. Um, Cats, of course, worked re really, really well. And, of course, there have been many, many productions of Jesus Christ Superstar now with different directors and different things, and some of those work really well and some of them not so well, you know. Um, but, but for a big musical, okay, say, take Lion King, which is huge, it's, it, 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 it's just every ingredient happening at once. I'm only a part of that. I'm just the musical cog in the wheel, you know. Well, I had the idea of how to do Phantom, um, but I'm not a director, I'm not a designer, I'm not a lyricist. Are there any performances alike, or is it a unique experience each time? Well, um, it is a unique experience because, um, by definition, anything you see in the theatre is not going to be exactly repeated every night. And you're going to get performances, and particularly with Phantom over the years. I mean, I've, I've lost count of how many Phantoms and Christines there have been I think around 16, the world. I think there were only 16 on, on it, Broadway, it, if on, I'm on correct. Broadway, that may, but may well be right. 16 Phantoms, yeah. yeah. But um, each one of those will have given a different, different performance. I'll go right back to Michael Crawford, you know. And he had an incredible command of the stage. That was the thing. The Phantom has to have authority. You, you, you mentioned the interview, and I want to take, take you back to it. Do you worry about the state of Broadway? Is this a symbol of something we should worry about in terms of the health of, of live theater here? I used to discuss all the time with Hal Prince um, about what we thought was going on with um, Broadway theater, and I think one of the things that he regretted enormously, as he said so before he, he sadly died, um, was that Broadway isn't really now the place where you're finding new work. Um, everything is tending to come from other places. And I mean, you've got to remember, Pal produced West Side Story. And West Side Story was a show that didn't do anything much at the Tony Awards, it didn't win Best Musical or Best Score. Um, and, um, but that kind of new work is becoming very, very difficult to produce. And so what I'm, I'm noticing is, is that more and more and more, um, either shows are really very small um, and therefore can in some way, you know, they don't, have, they don't have the kind of huge cost of something like, like a phantom, or they are really shop windows. Um, and my, my concern, you know, is, is that you're getting a lot of people who say publishers, you've got well, people, people who own now song catalogues and copyrights, and they say, OK, well, we just need to get this particular catalogue put together with a story or whatever, you know, and then we, then we get it on Broadway and, um, and then we can take it everywhere else. But what, what, what that means, really, I think, and I think this is the big danger, is, is that what Broadway could become is rather like, you know, you have to have a shop on Fifth Avenue if you're, you know, Gucci or whatever, you know, but you don't intend to make actually any money out of that shop. It's, it's just there as a flagship for everything else. And that isn't healthy. That's not healthy. And also the theatre-going experience, um, I think, compared with, say, the theatre-going experience in London now, I, 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 we're finding that, um, particularly, say, with the Theatre Royal Drury Lane, which I've completely restored, um, the people are coming now for the, the overall experience. So you get children who come there and feel they're really quite happy coming to Frozen and they love being there. But at the same time, we are doing events like the launch of the Crown and things, and, and because people want to come to the actual building and they want to have a good time. They want to know that there are restrooms and they want to be able to, you know, not have to go across the road to the bar the opposite because there's such a queue to use the restroom, particularly if you're a woman, you know. And it, it's this, it's all of this. There's a, there's a, you, you think, gosh, a million dollars a week you have to take to run a show like Phantom. It's very difficult. And, 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 and I mean, I, I, but I think most of all, it's, I, I wish that, you know, we, I mean, I'm trying to think now of an original musical or an original play, or which actually originated here. Mm -hmm. That's, I mean, and, That's and, a challenge. and, and yeah. but you've got to understand, 
I'm saying this because I love Broadway. I'm, I'm a, you know, I, ever as a Brit who just loved musicals, well, Broadway is it for, 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 mm -hmm. for, for me. And I just really, really hope that everybody starts to sort of think a little bit about the, I mean, the running costs, you know, the fact that you buy your ticket now um, in, and you're possibly playing, I mean, um, the, the, you know, there was one particular ticket agency which everybody has been using where, I mean, the, the actual average price in the Schubert Theatre was 38% over the, the pre-pandemic, over the cost of the actual ticket. And it, 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 this, this, isn't, this isn't good. So I was going to ask you what's next, but I know you're bound by confidentiality, but you have been selected to write the anthem well, I've for written, Prince Charles' I've, I've, coronation. I've, yes, I mean, there, there is Sorry, quite King a lot. King Charles. Well, King Charles, yes, yeah. and King Charles and Queen Camilla. Um, there, no, there, is, um, there are quite a few new pieces of music that's been, that have been commissioned, but I've, I've written uh, the moment as it stands. Mm -hmm. It's the moment um, after both of them have been crowned. And um, I think one of the things that the King was very, very keen to try and make is the occasion joyful. So I've chosen Psalm 98, which has the line in it, many, well, several times, make a joyful noise. And uh, so the anthem is called Make a Joyful Noise. I, I would think of all the, and, all the projects you've taken on, it, it's a very high pressure um, writing a work for a coronation. Well, Yes, it is. I, I mean, I'm, I'm excited by it. I'm a, a little nervous about the live performance because we have um, the Royal Air Force fanfare trumpeters. We have the Westminster Abbey Choir. Um, we have, obviously, the Westminster Abbey organ and an orchestra. And, but it, if they were all in one place, I would be quite, quite happy and then not too nervous. There's but no, they there's, aren't. There's no bandstand in, no, in so Westminster. You, so, you, so you've got your fanfare trumpeters here and you've got the organ over here. And then you've got the choir in the middle and the poor guy who's conducting it got to keep the whole lot together. So, I mean, I just that's what um, I'm worried about. But we have recorded it. So I know what it should sound like. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I hear a lot of confidence there, but no, but... no, no I, 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 it, it will be, it will be fine. But um, I, I have worked in the Abbey before, so I, I know it's um, quirks. But it, it is a huge, great, you know, Gothic, wonderful building. But it wasn't designed, you know, for um, something quite like this. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.